And um, for those of you who are just joining us, I'm Emily Lakdawalla from the Planetary Society. I'm a substitute. I alternate with Pamela Gay to host these things every other week. And this week, I'm with Robbie Herrick. And we're going to be talking a lot about Venus geology and geology on other places. This is the odd time in the podcast where we're waiting for various people to show up and actually notice that we're live. We'll get going with the conversation in a minute or two. So just sit tight while we share it all over the internets. While you're waiting, please plus one on uh, Google Plus or retweet my tweet. If you if you do that, please do so with um, the hashtags CQX Hangout. And we'll get started in just a second. Okay. Any other plus ones? Yes, OK, we're definitely live. Okay. So I think we're probably going to go ahead and get going. And uh, all right, so welcome, everyone, to the weekly space hangout, the science hangout here on CosmoQuest. I'm Emily Lakdawalla from the Planetary Society. Um, and with me is Robbie Herrick of the University of Fairbanks, Alaska, who I know is a Venus geologist, but apparently he's worked on lots of other planets as well. Um, and uh, he's got some really fantastic new data from a planet that we have not sent a geology mission to for a very long time. Um, before I a start asking him some questions about the work he's been doing recently, I would like to ask all of those of you who are watching this to please go to Google Plus and plus one it. Let us know that you're there. Um, post a comment, ask a question. I'll get to some questions later on in the broadcast. Um, you can also ask questions via Twitter using the hashtags hash CQX sorry, hash CQX, hash Hangout. And uh, now I think we'll go ahead and get started. So um, Robbie, I, you're, you have been working on a mission that is near and dear to my heart. I worked as a graduate student on Magellan, which was a mission that orbited Venus for many years and took these absolutely stunning radar images of nearly the whole planet. And, and people who are watching space exploration now have seen radar images most recently from the Cassini mission to Titan. But to me, uh, they always hark back to the Magellan mission's incredible data set. And you, I guess, have been doing some work recently that has created basically a brand new data set out of, uh, uh, from a mission that ended um, almost 20 years ago now. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that. Uh, sure. So, um, of course, the, uh, when the Magellan mission was going on, that was quite a long time ago. The capabilities of uh, computers at the time were uh, a lot less than they are now. And so uh, just to... Uh, Put it into context, when the Magellan mission was going on, the World Wide Web had not been created yet. Uh, Magellan was the first NASA mission where the data was distributed electronically, uh, and at the time it was distributed electronically by compact disk, so people on the team were mail boxes of compact disk, and that's how you got the the data and uh, all the data was uh, only a, it, it was so much data for at the time that uh, only about 10% of it was sent around at full resolution and most of it was sent at a, at a uh, lower resolution and you got these compact disks and all the, all the data was divided into one megabyte tiles because computers at the time could only uh, post could only handle a one megabyte image at the time and yeah, and I just I just have to interrupt here because th that was one of my first impressions of, of being a student was walking into the the lab at Brown and they had these big cases that had photographic prints and then there was there was an entire wall lined with just mountains of CDs from the Magellan mission. And I spent an awful lot of my time as a student, especially as a first year student, looking up the index, trying to figure out which image was on which CD, and taking each of those one megabyte squares, which were all separate files on the CDs, and assembling them into a, you know, a, a rectangular image that was a whopping 8,000 pixels wide. You know, who could handle that at the time? It was, it was pretty crazy. Yeah, and so. Uh at the time, during the Magellan mission, uh, the the way that uh, uh, the way that Venus operates, it, it rotates very slowly in a retrograde manner. 
And so because it rotates so slowly, the way the mission operated was to uh, simply orbit uh, the planet in a polar orbit and gradually build up an image of the whole planet. And so uh, after a Venusian day, which is 243 Earth days, you had a map of the whole planet. And at the time, the, the Magellan mission imaged for three Venusian days. And on the third Venusian day, it imaged uh, using the radar at a different um, look direction than the first uh, Venusian day. And the, the result of this, um, I won't get into, the, the, I won't get into how a synthetic aperture radar works, but the end result is that you end up with a pair of images that are very much like a, a stereo pair of photographic images. Um, yeah, it's um, it's it, most of the time when we have these polar orbiters, and actually the the spacecraft that are imaging Mars and, and the Moon right now at very high resolution. Typically, they're in a polar orbit and they look straight down most of the time. They have a nadir view on, uh, that's N-A-D-I-R, nadir, looking down at the planet. And then if they want stereo coverage on, on the next orbit or on an orbit maybe a, a few times later, they'll look at, slightly different ang at a slightly different angle at the same spot. And having the two slightly different angle looks gives them a bit of parallax from which they can get topography. Magellan worked somewhat similarly, except that it never looked straight down to get images. It was always tilted off to one side, and then the second look was tilted a little bit more so that, you again, you had some parallax from which you could assemble topography. Um, right, and so, um, yeah, the, the, the processing of, of radar is somewhat different than the processing of photographic images, but for the purposes of this discussion, there it's very similar, the end result, and uh, the, the effect is, is uh, the reason you get a 3D effect that's as if you're looking at something with your, your eyes separated by many kilometers instead of just a couple of inches. And, uh, and so if you have that data, then you can, uh, you can make some, use some relatively simple trigonometry and translate the uh, the movement uh, of features due to parallax in the two images and change that into uh, relative elevations. Um, so this data was collected back in the early 1990s and the, uh, the problem was that the data set at the time, this each day's worth of data is a few hundred gigabytes and that was considered an enormous amount of data to handle to do this stereo processing with. Uh, so it simply didn't get done. Uh, and uh, there were some tools developed that allowed one to uh, use very small amounts of stereo data and do some, uh, do some processing on small areas and it was somewhat labor intensive. And so what we did was go back and, and now, uh, of course, with, with modern day computers, a few hundred gigabytes of data is a little bit more than fits on an iPod, but not that much. And so it's a, it's a fairly small amount of data to handle. And there's some more sophisticated software out there that allows you to automate a lot of the data processing. And that's what we did. And so we went back and reprocessed this stereo data to, uh, to generate topography. And the reason that that was interesting at the time during the Magellan mission, it, in addition to having an imager, the radar was used as an altimeter and looked straight down and measured the time uh, for the radar pulse to go down and back. And, and as an altimeter, the Magellan mission collected data that had a horizontal resolution of about 20 kilometers, 10 to 20 kilometers. With the stereo data, we're able to, for the part of the planet that has stereo coverage, we we're able to improve upon the horizontal resolution and get down to about a kilometer or two horizontal resolution. So, uh, so it allows you to 
see some of the details uh, of the topography for uh, the areas that were imaged well, and we didn't really know what the topography was. So I'm sharing right now an image um, that you sent me, actually, from a presentation showing off your new data set. And um, on the left over here where it says GTDR, GTDR stands for Gridded Topographic Data Record. Um, and it's the map that they made from the altimetry data, which was, as you can see, at a much, much lower resolution than the beautiful images that we got back from Magellan. Um, and then on the right, I can see your new uh, topographic map. So, so tell us about this a little bit. OK, so what you're looking at, this was uh, just an example to to sort of show off the, uh, the topography. And right down the middle of uh, this particular area is on the side of a large uh, plateau area on Venus called Avda. And uh, the, in, this, uh, in the topography data, the highs are the orangish and the lows are the greens. And what you can see is that in the new data on the right, you're able to make out, make out some of the features of uh, the lava tube that is going through the middle of the radar image that's in the middle of the screen there. And you can see the, uh, the initial uh, collapse feature where the lava uh, was initially coming out. And so um, you're right, this is right at the, uh, this demonstrates about the, the, the capability of the new data set. Um, and the reason that getting these type, this level of detail is important is that it allows you to start uh, modeling and, and understanding some of the physical processes that form these features. And, and in doing so, you can learn something about you know, the depth and the width versus the width of these channels has something to do with the temperature of the lavas and, and how they're flowing across the surface and cooling while they flow. And, and things like that. So, so the new topography allows you to do some quantitative studies of geology that you couldn't do before. Uh, it also helps to distinguish features, to identify features that some features are obvious in the topography and not so obvious in the images and vice versa. Yeah, and I, I think those images also show off some of the things that I think are just so wonderful about the Magellan images. And by the way, is my face moving on the video because it's not on my own screen? Oh, there it goes. Um, sorry, Google Plus is still beta, so you never know uh, what's, what it's going to look like. The, the, Venus is just covered with these absolutely amazing volcanic features. and. It took me actually a long time before I, a long time of looking at Magellan images to just get into my head how much volcanism we're talking about here. Everywhere you look on the planet, everywhere, there are little tiny shield volcanoes, there are these canals and tubes that, that lava must once have flowed through. You can see lava flows of all kinds. It's, it's really, I mean, have you ever imagined, you know, standing on it or, or trying to, what life would be like underneath the clouds on Venus at, on a planet that had so much volcanism? Uh, well, it, I, I think it'd be the, the most, well, to me, the most interesting thing that you would notice if you were for on standing on most of the surface is how flat it is to begin. Huh. With. You would be on volcanic lava plains, and uh, the planet as a whole is extremely flat. About 80% of the planet is within 500 meters of the mean elevation of the planet. So. Um, you know, so as you walk around the planet, it's remarkably flat. If you look at the, there are some huge volcanoes in terms of their width. There are volcanoes that are uh, a thousand miles across, so they would, uh, you know, cover the entire state of Arizona. Um, and they're as wide as, say, Olympus Mons on Mars, but they're very flat. So you would have, unlike Olympus Mons, which is 20, over 20 kilometers high, the uh, volcanoes on Venus are only three or four kilometers high while being the same width. So, so you'd have these very low slopes that you could walk across. And uh, we, unfortunately, at the, uh, we don't have enough resolution to know exactly at sort of the human scale 
how uh, rugged the topography was would be. Uh, other than we have a couple, there's a, there was a handful of uh, landers that the, the Soviets landed on the surface, and from their from their view, it looks uh, pretty flat, like something that you would have no problem walking around on. But there are other areas of the planet where we just don't know. Uh, we get some clues from Magellan data, but we just don't know. Uh, at a human scale of walking around, really what it would be like. You know, it's, we don't have nearly the same detail that we get from, say, the Mars rovers and the Viking lander and, the, uh, um, and then the high-resolution cameras that we have for Mars. So, um, yeah, so this so I, is... I just had to share here, these. Um, this is one example of... Uh, that one of the images, this is Venera 14, and you can see the platy lavas that it landed on. These uh, uh, landers had some funky cameras that they looked, um, they were looking down very close to the lander at the center of these panoramic images, and they swept up toward the edges so that they, they just barely nicked the horizon in the corners here. So you're, you're mostly seeing uh, rocks in the foreground, but it's this kind of platy pahoe hoey lava that you might see on the slope of a Hawaiian volcano, and, and an awful lot of Venus must look like this. That's, that's the best guess as far as we can tell. Yes, that's right. I mean, it, from at the resolution of Magellan, we see uh, a very large portion of the planet that seems to resemble uh, lava plains like you might get at uh, around the Hawaiian volcanoes. There's other places around the world, like the uh, maybe the um, oh craters in the moon area in Idaho is probably a good uh, it's in Idaho. Yeah, that's a good example. And um, you know, so uh, it would be an interesting. The most interesting thing, though, of, about Venus is that because of the way the atmosphere uh, operates near the ground. It's very dense, and there's very little wind. So, uh, when you're walking around on Venus, of course, not there's no vegetation, but there's also no erosion. And so, uh, you would be, you know, the only the only analogs on Earth are places that are very recent and have experienced no erosion. So there's, there's very little sand and, uh, you know, so it really is just places like uh, around, you know, the new parts of the, the big island of Hawaii and, and other places where you've had lavas that have poured out within the last, uh, you know, several thousand, you know, tens of thousands of years on the Earth. Yeah, the, the way the atmosphere modifies craters on Venus is really fascinating. So I've got an example of one here whose name I forget. I don't know, as a quiz for you as a researcher, maybe I should ask you to name it off the top of your head. I cannot name it off the top <laughs> of my head. I can probably figure out in a few minutes. If I, uh, but, uh, so uh, so yeah, this is a Venus impact I, I crater. I know it's on the side of a corona there. Uh, but, uh, it's, um, uh, yeah, so what would you like to... It, it is a... The appearance is unusual. Um, would you like me to? Yeah, talk, talk to us about why craters on Venus. Look, they're very beautiful, but they're very strange looking. Okay. Uh, well, the first thing, uh, first let me point out one of the uh, differences between a radar image and uh, an optical image. Uh, at the so the radar image is sensitive to. Uh, this particular one operated at 12 centimeters, and so it's sensitive to uh, features at the sort of 12 centimeter scale. And when you look at this image, uh, the ejecta surrounding the central crater is very bright because uh, it is rough at the scale of uh, 10 to 15 centimeters, and so. Um, so if you were to look at this in an optical, uh, with, with a photograph, it would have a different appearance. The ejecta is probably more or less the same rocks as the surroundings. So the color 
uh, if you were to look at it with your eyes, the color would be very similar. But here, the ejecta shows up as very bright because it's very rough, it's very blocky from all the material that is thrown out. Now, this is also different from what you would see at the moon because you can see that the edges there look uh, kind of digitate and like there has, has been some flow in the ejecta uh, rather than, say, on an airless body like the moon where the ejecta just kind of gets thrown out and you get a, uh, a gradual thinning of the blanket uh, as you go away from the crater. Here, what we think happened, and uh, you know, we, we only have a vague idea at this scale of what happened, but what we think happened is that the material that was thrown out of the crater mixes with a very dense, turbulent atmosphere of Venus, and then things flow away from the crater uh, sort of like a pyroclastic flow around um, some of the volcanoes on Earth. So stuff mixes together and you get a density current and it flows out away from the, the, uh, the crater much like a, on a volcano. Um, I'm throwing yeah. a slightly different crater at you now. Just This is a, a more famous one, I think, because when you zoom out from this one, you get to another one of the weird things about Venus craters. Right, and so uh, this now, if you look at this crater and you go even farther out, you can see right around the crater is that rough, uh, very bright digitate ejecta blanket. And then outside of that, you can see a bright area. And then right towards the edges of the image you're looking at, you get kind of a uh, west or a left-facing parabola and all of this, uh, all of these very distal features have to do, uh, we think, with the, with the um, interaction of uh, ejecta as we get, uh, as, as the ejecta gets, some of the ejecta, particularly finer material, gets thrown up into the very uppermost parts of the Manusian atmosphere. And when that happens, you have some fine material. And then the once you get about, uh, I think it's about 40 or so kilometers up in the Venusian atmosphere, you have very strong prevailing westward blowing winds. And so material, it, if you have a big enough crater, you uh, the, the act of ejecting material kind of punches a hole through the atmosphere or through part of the atmosphere. You throw some material up into the upper atmosphere and then it gets blown uh, westward and creates this parabola out west. Uh, we don't understand all of the details of this process because some of the parabolas uh, are, uh, some of the parabolas are dark, some of them are light. Some of them show up in the imaging quite well. Some of them only show up in a different, a slightly different data set called the emissivity uh, data set. So um, we don't understand the full process, but it's the, the general idea is stuff gets thrown up into the upper atmosphere, and then prevailing west winds make this large parabola associated with uh, only what it seems to be only the freshest craters, and the and there's uh, eventually these parabolas seem to go away with time, and how they get erased with time is is another story. It's presumably some combination of weathering and a little bit of wind blowing things around, and, and so on. So I'm um, getting. Actually, before I ask you the next question, I should pause for a station identification. Again, this is Emily Lakdawalla of the Planetary Society on the weekly um, science hangout on CosmoQuest. And I'm, my guest is Robbie Herrick of the University of Alaska Fairbanks, who's talking with us about Venus topography and, and, uh, and um, features on other planets as well. In about um, 10 minutes or so, I'll probably uh, start throwing this out to questions from the audience. You can post questions in the comments on Google Plus or on Twitter by uh, posting a question with, with the hashtags hash CQX, hash hangout. 
and uh, I'll um, deliver them to Robbie and put them on the spot. But in the meantime, um, I wanted to ask you, Robbie, to talk a little bit more about what some, maybe some of the surprises you've learned from your newly processed Venus topography data set. Uh, well, uh, we've, uh, we've just sort of gotten into using the, the new topography to do things. Um, I guess uh, we, uh, the, a couple of uh, scientists I've been working with have been, uh, there's one group that's uh, up at Wesleyan University that has been using the data to uh, better uh, quantify the, the folding of uh, the topography that is in the, uh, what are known as the tessera regions on Venus. And Venus is uh, unique among the other uh, terrestrial planets in that it's the only one besides Earth that has what you would consider true mountain ranges that result from uh, something happening where you have crust uh, uh, on the surface moving horizontally and crunching together and making a mountain range like the, like the Rocky Mountains or the, the hip the Himalayas, and so... You know what's uh, exciting, Robbie, is that at uh, LPSC this week, the messenger team showed evidence for fold thrust belts on Mercury, where, where huge, long, linear chains of these uh, um, folds uh, that, that clearly do crustal shortening, they, they can, they've mapped them across some large areas of the planet. So that was pretty exciting. That added another that planet to that. I, I should have, uh, yes, <laughs> I, should, I should update that statement to, uh, yes, the... Um, on Mercury is in, I think they're still going with the main cause of that being a general shrinking of, of Mercury, but uh, there's also some evidence now on Mercury that uh, it does have some sort of true tectonics where convection in the planet's interior is having a, an effect in dragging things around on the surface. So, uh, however, I would still uh, say that the, the, what's going on on Mercury is, I think, uh, still not nearly as Earth-like as what happens on Venus. On Venus, there are some areas that are, uh, you know, where you really have some true fold and thrust belts, and you have also some areas that are very extensive, very wide, hundreds to a few thousand kilometers wide that are intensely folded, and and one idea is maybe these are uh, things that are like Earth's continents, but just not eroded at all. Um, and there's some speculation. We don't know whether they are of a different composition than the rest of the planet, like Earth's continents. But um, So one of the things that my colleagues have been doing is trying to figure out um, from what you can see whether the crunching that you see represents a whole lot of shortening of crust or just a little bit. And they, uh, they're they looking at sort of the, the amplitude of the folding and how symmetric the folding is. And they're coming to the conclusion that, uh, you know, it, it looks intensely deformed, but you're only shortening things by maybe a percent or two to generate that. Um, Another thing that's, that we're doing with the data is looking at uh, some of the really, there's a few uh, areas where we have coverage in the stereo of some of the lar really large volcanoes. So that's, that's uh, an example where uh, this is, these are two examples of the deformed terrain that you put up on the screen. Uh, and so the images are in the black and white and the topography is in the color. And then on the bottom is uh, an exaggerated profile through the topography. And so, so we're using that to kind of measure, try and estimate the amount of actual crunching in the surface that you need to produce the rugged topography that you see. Um, and, and so as I was going to go on, the, the other thing that uh, uh, some colleagues at the Lunar and Planetary Institute in Houston are working on uh, is uh, looking at the uh, some of the large volcanoes. Uh, some of these large volcanoes on Venus have rifts going through them. And what you can see in the inset of this photo is the 
topography from uh, the just the altimetry data and uh, the larger image is the topography from the stereo. And what's interesting about this is that in the stereo derived topography, the rift that goes through this volcano is much deeper. And so um, this changes the understanding of, of uh, of the timing of the rift relative to the volcano. And, and what we had before, uh, we thought that the rift, and uh, as we could see it, was forming sort of simultaneously with a lot of the volcanic flows that were coming out in the volcano. Now that the rift is so deep, it says that a lot of the, the strain and a lot of the rifting occurred after the volcano was almost entirely formed and then the rift forms and cuts quite deep into the volcano and so um, this started, we're starting to be able to use this to try and get uh, an overall picture of how the, the volcanoes are related to the rifts and the timing and, and then that translates into a broader story of how uh, those things relate to what's going on in the interior of the planet, which ultimately is causing the rifting and the big volcano. So. And this kind of thing, I think, is it's, it's what makes Venus so fun for structural geologists because there are so many different events that happened and they all overprint each other. So you've got the law of uh, superposition happening everywhere. You've got rifts, you've got volcanoes, you've got flows going into things, you've got craters, you've got craters getting deformed, and it's all it's all on top of each other and yet none of it has been eroded by not even wind because the atmosphere is so thick that that wind erosion doesn't seem to play a, a real strong role on Venus even as much as it does on Titan which has those those dunes blowing around um, it's just it's all laid bare for you to see and even though it's it's laid bare for you to see it's still kind of really difficult to figure out and it's been the source of much debate since since Magellan first arrived right yes well part of that is that um while Magellan gives you a great uh, regional picture of the geology and you can see uh, if you look at say some of these large volcanoes you can see uh, some some of the more gigantic flows uh, Magellan in general does not have the resolution for you to be able to see individual volcanic flows in most cases and it doesn't have the resolution for you to see uh, individual faults that, that help you uh, you know really figure out exactly what's going on in terms of the history of things and so uh, this the end result of this is that there uh, are some this has resulted in some completely different world views about the overall global geologic history based on uh, an, the way that people have made their inferences beyond the actual resolution of the data and what, what they think uh, based on what I see at Magellan resolution, what I really think is going on uh, at resolutions that you just can't, can't resolve. So. Sounds like we, we might could use another mission to Venus. Well, yes, of course. And I would like to, uh, you know, it's been, uh, so we're going on uh, 20, 23 years since NASA last launched a mission to, uh, to Venus. Uh, so it's, um, it's been a long, long, uh, <laughs> long time since there's, uh, the, the, the the Europeans have a mission that's orbiting Venus right now called Venus Express, but its its main focus is studying uh, the atmosphere of Venus and trying to understand the, the, mostly the upper the circulation of the upper cloud deck and getting uh, using some instruments to get the, some of the the composition of different layers in the upper atmosphere. And it has it, it there's been some 
of that data that's been useful for studying the surface, but not much. And so the, the funny thing about Venus Express is that, uh, like Cassini at Titan, it does have a camera that is capable of seeing what are called through uh, seeing through windows in the atmosphere, a, a region where the the primary um, opaque constituent of Venus's atmosphere is somewhat transparent to light. So it's a, it's an infrared wavelength. You can sort of see through the clouds, but the problem is that at any kind of infrared red wavelength at Venus, Venus is so hot that it actually radiates heat at those wavelengths. And as on Earth, things are colder at higher elevations and hotter at lower elevations. So pretty much all you can see when you see with infrared light through Venus's clouds is topography. And, and it's really hard to take that effect out and see any kind of detail using, um, using these optical imagers. So we really got to get something beneath the clouds. That's right. And uh, well, uh, I'm I'm a fan of uh, I would like to see us go back. I, my my general feeling is based on uh, what what happened in in the 1990s. Um, you know, after after the Viking mission, we had a, we had a, a, a data set for Mars uh, from Viking that is pretty much in many ways similar in quality to the data set that we now have from the Magellan mission. And of course in the late 1990s, uh, the, um, the Mars uh, Global Surveyor mission flew that had the Mars uh, laser altimeter, MOLA, um, that was the Mars Orbiter Laser Altimeter. It was originally Mars Observer, of course, until Mars Observer failed. But uh, so the the MOLA data, and then the uh, Mars Orbiting Camera, which was the mock data, and those two instruments, uh, which provided higher resolution of uh, data on the topography and imaging of Mars. Uh, completely revolutionized our understanding of Mars and showed, uh, you know, really uh, showed the history of Mars to be uh, a lot more complex and interesting than uh, we we got from the Viking data. And so, and with that data, we could. You know, there are a lot of things in Viking that were assumed to be single geologic units that were that turned out to be incredibly complicated uh, units that had occurred over long time spans, and and so uh, I expect that if we did something similar at Venus, we would get a completely revolutionary understanding of the the history of Venus, and so. Um, you know, to me, it, it, you know, what we need for Venus is what was provided by MOLA and Mach at Mars, and, and of course the subsequent uh, imaging systems that flew on on later uh, orbiters like like Themis and uh, the high rise camera have only reinforced that that belief. That um, there are, there are other things, of course, that you can do at Venus. There's a whole uh, list of interesting missions you could do, but for for my uh, personal bias, um, you know, you uh, in terms of bang for the buck and and what you can, uh, you know, it's hard in terms of our studies of Mars. It's hard to beat the Mola and Mach uh, instruments in terms of how they revolutionize the understanding of Mars and. I think you know those are good things. That that's what I would fly at Venus if I was to go next. But uh, you're the one on camera, so you can be as biased as you want. Okay. Um, with the uh, with Mola and the uh, and later on, we've actually um, we've flown uh, Lola at the Moon, and now it's MLA at Mercury on Messenger. That's that's provided us with these new insights into the fact that there are fold thrust belts and and possibly maybe even some kind of small mantle convection features on Mercury. And so, yeah, laser altimetry is really fantastic. But can you do laser altimetry at Venus? Can you get an, an optical laser? Do you need a different kind of wavelength of laser in order to get through those clouds? 
Um, right. So at Venus, uh, no, you cannot use a, a laser altimeter. Um, and uh, what you would have to do is there, there are various schemes that you use with radar to, to improve uh, to get high resolution topography. There's, a, there's actually three, three different ways that you, can, uh, that you can get topography at Venus using radar. One is simply to uh, use a, uh, a more sophisticated uh, radar altimeter um, than uh, was done with Magellan. And, and you, can, you can get a, a somewhat narrower footprint and you can do some more sophisticated uh, processing, particularly if you have more uh, power going into your altimeter. You can do some more sophisticated processing, and you can uh, get uh, something pretty good that way. Uh, of course, as we demonstrated, you can use stereo, uh, stereo imaging uh, if you were to, you know, if you do higher resolution imaging of the surface of Venus and you do it in stereo, then you can uh, get topography that way. And then uh, the third option uh, is using a technique called uh, interferometric uh, synthetic aperture radar. And um, this is uh, a little difficult to explain in, in a very short time frame, but uh, the, the general idea is that you take images that are uh, from a platform that are separated by uh, a fairly short distances. And you take an image and then take another one from tens of meters uh, different perspective. And it's, uh, you use the interference pattern of the individual wavelets that are coming back and the distortion of that pattern. You get a particular pattern and then topography distorts that pattern and from the distortions in the interference pattern you can derive topography. And this in fact uh, was done on the Earth in what was known as the shuttle radar topography mission a few years back and that became uh, the kind of default, uh, you know, generated high resolution topography for uh, uh, most of the, well, for the latitude bands that the shuttle flies at, uh, which does not cover Alaska, by the way, but, or most of Alaska. But, um, so, so there are different ways that you can use radar to, uh, to get, um, to get high resolution, to, to improve dramatically over what Magellan was able to collect. But, um, yeah, but you, you do not have the option of using optical, you know, LIDAR or the, the laser altimeters work at, at optical, mostly optical wavelengths or near optical wavelengths. And so uh, they won't penetrate through the clouds, so you can't, can't use that option. All right, well, we're getting on to about 45 minutes into this broadcast, so I think it's time to open things up for questions. Again, those of you who are watching this on Google+, I'm Emily Lakdawalla from the Planetary Society with Robbie Herrick from the University of Alaska Fairbanks talking about Venus geology. And um, I hope you will plus one this broadcast on Google+, so we can see how many people of you are actually watching live. Um, I know that a lot of you are probably watching this recorded, and we'd like to hear from you then, too. You can just post a comment on the... On the um, on the YouTube video. Um, but for those of you who are watching live, you now have an opportunity to ask questions. You can post those in the comments on Google Plus or via Twitter using the hashtags hash CQX, hash Hangout. And I'll look for those and ask them of Robbie. I see one question so far from um, uh, Samer Hariri, who wants to know about the age of Venus's surface. And he, he notices that the pictures of the craters, it makes it look very lava-like, as though there's lava right there. Can you talk about how how old is the surface of Venus, and, and is there really lots of lava just lying around very close to the surface, ready to erupt, or, or is it more like Earth? Well, that, uh, that is one of the uh, debates that has come out of the Magellan mission. Uh, overall, the surface of Venus is uh, substantially younger than the 
uh, the other non-Earth terrestrial planets. So on, on the whole, the uh, most most of what we see on the surface is certainly less than a billion years, whereas if you look at the Moon or Mercury or, or Mars, uh, you're, you're looking at surfaces for the most part, certainly and, and excluding what's going on on Mars with, with some erosional you know, dust dunes and things like that, you're looking at surfaces that mostly are, are in the few billion year range. So uh, Venus as a whole is much younger than those other planets and its mean surface age, depending on who you talk to, is somewhere between tens of millions of years and a few hundred million years. And so for comparison, um, in terms of uh, the Earth, uh, all of the Earth's ocean basins have, have formed within the last couple hundred million years. So. Um, now, how that is distributed in detail on Venus is a topic of debate. There are some people you might, that... You have might say that. It's just a little bit debated in the Venus community. So there are some, there are some people that have looked at... Uh, so based on... And where this comes from on Venus, we don't have the ability to date the rocks on Venus uh, remotely. So where this is coming from is all from the cratering record. So compared to, say, the Moon or Mercury, uh, Venus is uh, relatively crater-free. There are less than a thousand impact craters on uh, the surface of Venus, which is uh, many times the surface area of the Moon. It's uh, pretty comparable to the number of craters on Earth, actually. Uh, right. Well, there's... Uh, Yes and no. I mean, there's a few, there's a couple, there's a few hundred craters that have been uh, discovered on Earth, but those are better described as impact structures. So when you're counting the number of craters on Earth, you're counting, uh, you're you're counting about 250 things that, from an aerial photograph, you could not really recognize as a crater, and you're counting about a dozen things that actually look like a typical impact crater with a raised rim and a, and a hole in the ground and things like that. Whereas on, on Venus, the, the thousand craters, these are uh, well enough preserved that you can clearly tell that they're an impact crater and they've got ejected and things like that. Um, where the debate comes in is to, uh, there is, uh, there are two viewpoints uh, as to uh, some people think that all of these craters have uh, more or less been unaltered since they formed. Uh, work that I and some of my colleagues have done suggests that the majority of these have experienced at least some flooding by, uh, by later lavas. And so... And the reason uh, that this distinction is important is because if all the craters were unaltered since they formed, then that means that um, nothing geologically has happened to the surface since they formed. And so you basically had a clean slate of the whole planet, and then nothing's happened since that clean slate was made. And if that's true, then, this, then something happened to all of Venus 500 million years ago to erase everything and basically start over. Whereas if you... Um, are finding evidence that things have been modified since they formed, and that means that Venus has been geologically active more recently. That's right. And so uh, I tend to think that the, uh, the, the latter has happened, that there's been a continuous, uh, you know, there's been uh, a, a fair amount going on. Now, the interesting thing is from the Magellan mission, because of its relatively short duration of a couple of years and the resolution it had, we did not have, we don't really have the ability to answer through direct examination as to whether volcanism is currently occurring on the surface. It yeah, it's probably a pretty good much. indicator. If a debate has been going on for 20 years that there simply isn't the data necessary to solve the debate. <laughs> Right. So, uh, yeah. And uh, so if we, you know, the 
even under the most pessimistic scenarios that, that people have, Venus almost certainly is still active volcanically, but whether that level of volcanism is a small fraction of Earth's level of volcanism or equal or maybe even exceeding Earth's level of volcanism is, is uh, a, a matter of debate and uh, that, that's another thing that it would be nice to go back and, and have a mission that somehow is able to try and monitor and, and determine uh, to some degree the level of current volcanic activity. Yeah, one thing that's changed Mars geology a lot recently is the fact that we've had spacecraft in orbit there for so long. It's been well over a decade, and we've been able to see actual places on the surface of Mars change with time. Most of these changes are things like dry dust avalanches. You don't need very active geology for them to happen. But still, even the changes that we have noticed are so much more than anybody thought uh, so much more activity on Mars than anybody really thought was happening before uh, Mars Global Surveyor actually arrived. And we've never had a mission at Venus for long enough, or a series of missions at Venus long enough, that could actually detect changes, look for um, places that are pretty young volcanoes, and see if there's any change in the pattern of if there's a new lava flow that forms over time. Like you can see at Io, for instance. You can see those. Um, the mountains on Io are changing all the time because there's constant eruptions there, and you can actually track this lava flow between you know, September uh, 79 and, and so on. And, and we can't do that for Venus. We just don't have the data, and that's another reason why we need another mission that can see beneath those clouds. Right, and, and one thing to point out, almost all the changes that we've observed on Mars, these are changes that you can see in images that are, you know, tens of meters across with a resolution of a, a meter or a few meters or less. And so uh, none of, all of these would be single pixels in the Magellan data. So even if we could go back uh, now and recollect another day of Magellan, uh, the resolution is still low enough that it would really be hard to, to do that. And we will actually have, uh, because uh, Arecibo is going to collect a map of Venus this summer, at, uh, and that will be data that's even worse resolution Magellan, but like a one to two kilometer image. And so if there's some huge, enormous change, we'll be able to detect it because we have uh, an image from Arecibo from 1980. And so, and, and they're going to collect it almost identical viewing geometry and conditions as then. So, so this summer, there will be a new data set collected by uh, Bruce Campbell and his colleagues at Arecibo, and they will, in fact, try and look and hope for some Really, it would really be a big change if they detect something, but they'll have a chance to do that this summer. That's cool, and I guess it's worth mentioning that Venus Express has been looking for things like uh, glowing warm hot spots or strange puffs of new gas in the atmosphere, and so far has not found anything that's convincing to anybody. So it's, that's a bit of a disappointment, I think, but, um, uh, but they're still looking. They are there, and they're looking. Um, but, you know, we're getting pretty close to 5 o'clock my time, I guess 4 o'clock your time, and I think that probably that's a, the, the, the notion that it will at least have some kind of new data set coming this summer is a, is a good place to stop, but it's, um, it's, uh, it's also a good time, I think, to ask people to write their congressmen and say that NASA needs more money in order that we can fly some more great missions, either orbiting Venus and looking down as you want to, or getting under the clouds and driving around. Man, do I want a rover on the surface of Venus. That would be so cool. Right, um, yes. The, well, the, uh, it, as a final comment, the, the, one of the challenges in, in getting below the clouds is having something last for a long time on the surface. And so uh, some of the concepts that people have floated to uh, rather than having rovers, say, is to have something that's in a, a balloon and dips down for a couple of hours and, and looks at the surface and takes some pictures and then goes back up into the upper clouds. And so if you get about, if you actually get about 30 kilometers up in the Venusian atmosphere, it's at about room temperature and, and 
Uh, but the clouds are at very high elevation, right? So even if you're that high, um, you can still, it's, you're still very far from the surface. You wouldn't have the resolution that you would have closer to the surface. But the clouds are still above you, I believe, at 30 kilometers. Yes, I think that is true. I think they're at like 50 kilometers. That's true. And it, but it's, it's tough to know what the thermals would be like in terms of how they would distort images. Right. Surface. But yes, yeah, so that's, uh, but anyway, so, you know, just, uh, I'm not sure if a rover is feasible, but uh, there are some other cool Make ideas that people have, have floated in terms of landers and balloon things that you could explore the surface in ways that, uh, of course, on Mars, you can't, a balloon is uh, a much more, you have a lot less atmosphere to work with. So, uh, and, it would and, work great on Titan, though. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so there are a lot of other ideas out there for how to explore Venus, uh, but I mean, it's all a matter of money and technology. Right, as it always is. <laughs> Venus, Venus may be a little bit more so than others, but that's no excuse for not going back. So um, on that note, I think I'll, I'll thank you, Robbie, for taking the time to both set this up and to sit through a, an hour of conversation and tell us all about Venus. Um, and this has been, I'm Emily Lakdawalla for the Planetary Society, and uh, thank you all, those of you who have been watching us converse about Venus geology. If you're still watching, please plus one this on Google Plus so we can know how many are watching live, and then if you're watching it recorded, please post a comment or a, or a like or whatever, it, actually I forget what you do on YouTube now, um, to, uh, uh, to indicate that you've watched and that you like it. So thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Robbie, very much. Oh, and thank you for uh, hosting this, and it's my, my pleasure, and I'm always happy to uh, talk of Venus to anyone who will listen, so thanks for Excellent. All right, thank you, and uh, hope to talk to you again. All right, bye-bye.